Thank you, Philip. And uh, theoretically, I could do my lecture quite short because the why has been very uh, nicely, very clearly uh, just explained uh, or having been explained by Philip in the talk before. So uh, um, whatever I say is more or less an echo of uh, what Philip uh, told us. And of course, we were already discussing in the past. Nevertheless, uh, I would like uh, to kind of also set up the scene for tomorrow's uh, workshop and uh, discussions uh, from the point of view from EAN. Uh, and I would like to start uh, with two setting up the scenes. Before sharing data, I guess we need to create the data or we need to systematically handle existing data. So it is the step before. And um, the second uh, scene uh, I would like to set up is of course, also how could EAN with its large body of national societies and also large uh, members uh, across Europe contribute to whatever has been said uh, this afternoon. So uh, first I would like to start, of course, to remind us that about uh, a bit more than 10 years ago, the data volume in the World Wide Web was approximately 500 exabytes. And in 2020, we have exceeded, uh, not uh, the exabyte, we have exceeded the setabyte, which is um, uh, calculated as more than 40 setabyte of, um, of, of data available. And for those who are not quite sure how many nulls uh, this regard, you can see um, then an explanation in terms of a more familiar gigabyte uh, expression. However, the question is who generates this data? And of course, I think, and most importantly, we all do it in a daily uh, fashion, in a probably uh, not really completely aware fashion, but nevertheless, uh, there are, of course, uh, data generators on the individual basis. And this also is a, a very important point, what we heard before from Ignacio, for example, but also from others, are the, the, uh, the legal ownerships uh, or questions regarding legal ownerships, because then uh, we are, of course, also the primary owners, the primary holders of those data. And this does not only account for, let's say, uh, recreational uh, data. This also accounts, of course, for individual health data. This uh, accounts for health data, uh, which uh, are probably uh, generated by uh, biosensors or digital devices, which we have agreed to use or we use anyway, like uh, step countings and so on and so on. So this is the one site. Uh, and uh, the challenges, of course, to, uh, I think in a very gross way, is of course the question of the availability and the accessibility. And this is just uh, an image showing the 100 billion nodes of Facebook, or now it's, uh, I think, rephrased, but you can see this on this, uh, on this uh, global map. And definitely there's a, uh, a, great, um, a great level of inequality. And this also regards, and um, you can see this on the, on the right side, also on the uh, uh, on the amount of data storage. So of course, I think, and this is one of the major questions and very simple is how uh, or, or who has uh, access to the data? So uh, yes, sorry, who has access to the data? And of course, who is the owner of the data? And uh, of course, we have heard we have to divide uh, primary ownership, secondary ownership, uh, um, secondary uh, um, uh, uh, caregiving also regarding data, et cetera, et cetera. Nevertheless, I think this is uh, one of the issues with regard to individual data, which are generated in a more or less daily fashion. The second point, of course, is the institutional data generation. And uh, uh, I don't know whether this still holds uh, true, but uh, about uh, two years or three years ago, it was said that medical information doubles uh, more or less every four years. 
and this is mainly also driven by uh, 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 medical publications. There are more than three million a year. And again, uh, with reference to our uh, COVID-19 pandemic, uh, I think we all are aware that in the past two years, since the uh, um, advent of the pandemic, uh, more than 200,000 publications have been done on this topic. And I guess uh, it g creates a lot of difficulties uh, to browse uh, and to get into uh, um, uh, in depth of all these publications. Nevertheless, I think there is uh, also one very clear uh, uh, fact, and this says, or this is uh, uh, a fact, that humans are limited in updating and processing information. And this is plain and simple because we can't read faster anymore. Uh, there are some techniques, and uh, probably all of us who are um, uh, in an academic uh, situation are uh, uh, faced with every day's time management, including updating ourselves on our um, uh, scientific, but also probably clinical important uh, information. So we browse a lot of texts. Uh, this is of course a technique to accelerate reading. However, it's definitely debatable whether this also accounts for understanding of the content. So uh, at the end of the day, we are the bottleneck in the world of information. However, and I think this is also nicely to, um, to, um, to mention, we are also equipped with a kind of uh, uh, option, which means uh, forgetfulness, which then also allows us to be more or less the last authority for organized ignorance to filter data or information flood. So of course, because we are the bottleneck for that. On the other hand, of course, no doubt, um, this also accounts uh, for the fact, and now I'm, here we are, that knowledge gets lost hereby. And or uh, knowledge or new findings are not detectable because of the non-association uh, of the existing data. So uh, this brings me to the next challenges, and we have already talked to this and uh, mentioned this uh, during the afternoon or this afternoon several times, that 80% of the data which are outside there, which are available, which are stored uh, in some uh, um, uh, silos are unstructured. And already Al Gore a uh, couple of years ago said, we have warehouses of unused information rotting around while uh, critical uh, questions are left unanswered and critical problems are left unresolved. So uh, I don't mean that um, uh, by unstructuredness, because there are some, let's say, definition um, debates, or uh, we need to define what is meant by unstructured data. This is not necessarily also the same uh, with regard to raw data. Um, but unstructured means that uh, uh, in the same way as, for example, Philip mentioned in his uh, previous talk. And the other thing is, of course, and I think this is something which we are facing in medicine and especially also uh, in, a, uh, in a situation with a lot of information, uh, that the world is richer in associations than meanings. And it is part of the wisdom and probably also part of the techniques we have to develop or which are already on the way to differentiate the two, which means uh, the causal versus the association. Uh, link. And we have a demand. And I think there is no doubt, uh, Philip already mentioned this in his talk before, precision uh, medicine, uh, individualized uh, medicine, deep neurology, deep medicine. So we have a demand. We also have a kind of commitment and the goal, which means uh, we want to get into uh, deeper and longer and extensive pathways of uh, uh, individualized precise neurology in our uh, case. And therefore, of course, we have to compile all these uh, various sources and also the various demands from our patients, from our institutions, and last but not least, our own demands, of course, to a kind of 
aggregated um, approach in uh, uh, with the title of deep neurology. So how can uh, EAN and um, uh, not EAN as a name of an organization, but as I already mentioned uh, in my introduction, as a kind of body of uh, a huge number of uh, national institutions and also national um, uh, individual ne uh, members, but uh, even more uh, by its uh, number or huge number of members uh, through the national societies. And we also heard in this afternoon that, of course, on the European community level, then there will be also some demands, some uh, invitations uh, to national health services. And I think we as neurologists, via our national societies, can at least approach our health authorities that, um, you know, not probably for every uh, 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 speciality, or we are not, uh, 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 we are not uh, necessarily uh, advocating every, uh, every speciality, but specifically, of course, neurology. And therefore, I think this is a huge body of, um, of acceleration, but also facilitation uh, on the various level, be it on the more legal on the governance, on the transparency level, but of course also on the scientific level. And last but not least, uh, most importantly, of course, on the clinical level to translate uh, these um, data sharing into daily um, uh, routine practice and to uh, achieve an advantage, not only for uh, making our lives as physicians and neurologists probably easier, but especially also to make it better for um, our patients. And again, this matches, of course, very well also the mission, uh, the vision, uh, and uh, uh, as I said, the mission of the EAN in reducing the burden of neurological disorders. And I guess this is the same, uh, of course, also for all the other institutions and programs we heard today, um, uh, because this is the ultimate goal we are longing for. So uh, having said that, I think, uh, of course, the EAN also uh, recognizes that the, not everything uh, is uh, uh, to be done within the next uh, one or two years. So there will be midterm or even long-term uh, uh, pathways necessary. And there are, of course, a lot of um, our challenges on the various levels, be it scientific, clinically, on the education uh, level, on the legal level, on the advocacy level, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, I think no doubt as an organization, but also um, if you are um, engaged not only in uh, um, uh, everyday practice, but also in addition in a research group, in a research organization, or up uh, to a uh, large organization like the Academy, then of course you also see these challenges as opportunities. And this um, is of course driven by uh, what we heard, the burden of the disease of neurological disorders across Europe. We heard this uh, several times, but definitely uh, what we also already mentioned several times and will be even more mentioning uh, the next uh, one and a half days is the term of how to handle data, how to digitalize data, how to feed data, and how to make uh, the digital health space uh, more usable, not only as a theoretical uh, framework or not only as a playground for highly sophisticated research group, but to do it in a very democratic way, which means broaden it to uh, institutions, even uh, on the very uh, local level. And uh, again, I would like to echo what uh, Philippe uh, told us that the medical informatics platform is not restricted to a, let's say, um, top academic uh, uh, institution uh, with a lot of research abilities or a lot of funds uh, available. It is uh, in a very democratic uh, way in balancing various uh, 
existing in uh, equi uh, equalities uh, across um, across Europe, which are still uh, existing across Europe. So um, again, uh, the massive amount of data that is now that is available could provide an advantage and enhance our knowledge and understanding of brain diseases. I think there is no doubt because this is what uh, uh, Philippe Rivlin uh, uh, in his prior talk uh, defined as the why. Um, the scientific committee, and I have the honor to represent the EAN uh, scientific committee, um, as again, I think uh, several levels of commitments, but also initiation or propagation and continuation of scientific efforts, uh, as I said, on various levels. Of course, uh, the backbone of the um, scientific community within the EAN are the scientific panels. You can see that there are nearly 30 scientific panels, which means they cover every neurological disorder which we can imagine or which are existing, and therefore also providing a potential of uh, experts, of scientists, of uh, imminent researchers and clinicians with a lot of experience uh, and expertise um, uh, to the various, uh, various disorders, and therefore also uh, has a kind of potential and uh, powerful and mightiness uh, to engage in their specific uh, clinical and scientific uh, research effort to um, the various uh, options, as we heard, for example, in the data sharing opportunities, as an example, very importantly, uh, of the MIP, as Philippe Rivlin uh, showed us. However, it's not only the obvious data sharing in a scientific uh, or the scientific uh, uh, cohort uh, which you are interested in at your local site. There are also other uh, options where we can use this data sharing. For example, and this is also a, 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 a very important um, um, activity uh, of the scientific committee is also to be uh, very strongly engaged in guideline production um, together with the EAN guideline production group. And again, uh, guidelines are a kind of leading tool, uh, again, uh, offering uh, the utmost current um, scientific um, background for a kind of advice, recommendation to approach uh, patients or their diagnostics or their treatments uh, in a kind of um, algorithmic way. And this again uh, does not only refers to high end uh, or high income countries, it's a more, uh, of course, again, democratic way because this accounts for every uh, individual patient, every individual uh, neurologist, uh, anywhere in the, in the European uh, world um, to adhere to this recommendation. However, data sharing may also facilitate and validate and prove uh, the use of guidelines uh, uh, on various levels, meaning in the establishment, in the production, but also at the end of the day uh, as their usefulness and whether there are truly the standards as compared uh, to local, um, uh, local practice or even national practice. So uh, data sharing and especially also with specific regard on the uh, medical informatics platform which we have been introduced by Philippe Rivlin is a excellent tool also uh, to be used for um, uh, guideline production and validation. So uh, with regard to the scientific panels, uh, in advance to this uh, workshop, we also uh, sent a, a small survey to all co-chairs of the various scientific panels and to ask whether uh, there are already experiences with the uh, data sharing, with the uh, registries, etc. And these are, of course, uh, uh, meant 
not uh, to um, to uh, or if they were meant to stimulate already in advance the discussion, which will be definitely tomorrow uh, more intense because again, as you have seen from the program, this will uh, provide all the insights and thoughts from all scientific panels of the year end. And the interesting thing is that uh, it's a bit astonishing and probably also uh, uh, defining the need of higher awareness of higher opportunities and definitely higher uh, performance of data sharing um, um, across Europe and across all the existing data which are there on the national uh, or even more on the local side because excellent science is already of course done but it could be as in any quality management, we can always do better. And this uh, data sharing will definitely uh, improve the quality. The guideline production I've already mentioned. So this means I'm coming to the end already. Um, I think that from the EAN view, and this is very strongly, of course, also driven by my personal view on that, that the digitalization, the digital health space, and also the, the consequences of that, which means uh, individualized precision neurology for a better um, uh, uh, living uh, of our patients, either in the treatment or even better in the prevention of at least some of neurological disorders is of utmost importance as a prerequisite to, um, to, uh, to um, establish systematically uh, daily routine patient uh, data, either generated by the patient himself, or of course, as generated and documented uh, by us as physicians, they need this, uh, a systematic structure and they need to be fed into a common tool um, to um, uh, share data with all the advantages we heard before, not um, uh, uh, without any need uh, to uh, leave the, uh, the, the local host organization uh, with all the uh, needs and requirements regarding data protection and ownership. But this is, I think, the pathway. And therefore, it's no doubt that, um, uh, that data sharing will definitely stimulate also the science, it will not only create big data, it will create knowledge gain out of this big data in a, let's say, scientific and not commercial uh, uh, way. And I think this is also a very important point and prerequisite and also commitment. Uh, uh, we from the European Academy of Neurology are most uh, interested, of course, that this is a non-commercial uh, scientific um, uh, approach that, uh, of course, I think there's no doubt that uh, data sharing will reduce the burden of unexploited research. It will uh, play a critical role in mitigating the problems of reduced sample sizes. And of course, at the end of the day, seamless flow of information turns fragmented, uh, fragmented information and data into a complete pre, uh, patient profile in our demands or at least visions of uh, precision neuro neurology in the midterm uh, with uh, collecting all the necessary data to create this individual patient profiles to ultimately improve the quality of care of our patients. And I would like to stop with this, uh, with this map. And um, this is not the existing um, map of corporations regarding data sharing uh, across Europe or the ad adjacent uh, Mediterranean countries. No, this is the supply and support hub connecting uh, connection of the former Roman Empire. So what you can see here that they had a very good sense of, uh, of um, establishing their power, their mightifulness, but also the way how it works via a very stringent uh, connective system. And I think uh, as we can learn from the past to understand the future, this is the last slide I would like to show. And thank you very much for your attention.